Jesus teaches in the Bible to share the gospel with all people around the world, including children. And today's guest certainly thinks so. We're joined by Moses Estevez. He's the Executive Vice President with Child Evangelism Fellowship. Moses, welcome to Bridge City News. Thank you so much for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself and Child Evangelism Fellowship, or CEF. Sure. I was uh, born in Portugal and uh, was saved as a child at age nine. At age 17, I had a calling for ministry. It's a long story how I ended up in the U.S. working with Child Evangelism Fellowship now for 30 years. The ministry of CEF started um, in the early 20s when our founder, Jesse Overholzer, had a passion from God to evangelize children. The ministry actually got organized in 1937, and uh, and he... Uh, 15 years later, he passed away, and uh, by then we had ministry started in about 60 countries around the world. Today, we have about 3,500 full-time staff. We're organized in most nations of the world. We have 400 offices in the USA, and the CEF family, with the help of thousands and thousands of volunteers from local churches, is very busy communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ to the next generation. Well, that's amazing. Uh, why, why do you feel that it is, it is absolutely key to share the gospel with children? Well, it, we're moved and mobilized by the words of the Lord when he said, let the little children come to me. Um, actually, Psalm 78 has, has precious verses uh, concerning children where he says that he wants the next generation to hear about the Lord. As a matter of fact, in, in verse 6, he says that the next generation may know them, uh, the commandments of God, and to know God, the children yet unborn. So he's got a burden. God has a burden for the generation that doesn't even exist yet. And arise and tell them to their children. So now he's talking about two unborn generations, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the work of God and keep his commandments. So as you read through the scriptures, you see just this passion that God has for the children to know him, for the children to worship him and walk with him and experience all the wonderful things God has for them. That comes clearly in the scriptures, especially Matthew 18, 14, that said, it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So God desires children to know him. Now, Kids are really impressionable, and I think that's, uh, that's a big reason why we should be reaching children. But what would you say to those who may argue that it isn't acceptable to present religious teachings to children as they aren't old enough to make these kinds of choices for themselves? Well, if you look into the scriptures, you actually see a moment when that happened, when Jesus had children around him and he was ministering to them, and the disciples showed up and began to shoo the children away. And Jesus said, no, 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 let them come to me. Um, so God desires for us to minister to children at a young age. Children at a young age have a, a very open heart to God. And, you know, the, the, the backpack of sin hasn't been filled up yet, as it happens when the years go on and into adulthood and, and the hearts become seared. Children have hungry hearts for God. You tell them the truths of God, of the gospel, and most of them readily accept and believe they have tender hearts. As a matter of fact, the Lord says that uh, for anybody to be saved, they need to become such as a child, which we jokingly say that all evangelism is child evangelism in that sense. Now, you have a very ambitious goal, uh, Moses. You want to reach a hundred million children per year with the gospel. So tell us, how many children have you reached so far and in how many countries? Sure. Uh, we have the ministry organized in most nations of the world. So we have a massive structure in place. Again, 400 officers in the USA. And we've been doing this since the uh, 1930s. And uh, in 2019, so that was the year before COVID, we reached 25 and a half million children with the gospel. And 90, 2% of these, 93% uh, of these are face-to-face -face ministries, a trained teacher with literature, CF literature, ministering to children in a small group or large group of children. And of course, COVID uh, was a real problem for face-to-face -face ministries like ours. 
And so after COVID, we've been rebuilding the work. And of course, some countries got devastated by COVID. Last ministry year in 22, we were able to minister to 19.5 million children. And so we're on our way uh, to grow that rapidly. We're Think of your vehicle with multiple accelerators. We have a lot of these things in place, the, the tested programs, the, the expertise, the workers, the, the organizational structure. So we're accelerating different things like Good News Club, which is our weekly Bible club that we hold in schools and many other locations. We're accelerating a Christmas outreach that we do that's unbelievable. The kids love to come to Christmas parties and hear the true meaning of Christmas. We're accelerating, for example, uh, children reaching children. You take the older kids, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, that are Christians and committed to the Lord, and you take them aside and you train them how to share the gospel. And watch out, because we're doing that in several places around the world. We're accelerating, and they go out boldly telling the story of Jesus and sharing the gospel with their friends. You know, sometimes adults are a little hesitant. Well, kids are not. They're very bold. And uh, and so I'm also excited about that. Can you imagine uh, the new generation of evangelists that are going to come out of this effort for the body of Christ, for the church around the world? So there's many different things we're accelerating to allow us to get to 100 million a year uh, or per year of children reached around the world. So tell us more about your plan to do this, like how you go about reaching that many children. Because I understand that you have trained over 400,000 teachers. Yes, we have very strong training programs and uh, some are shorter, some all are longer, all the way to three months. And we uh, have the, the entire structure set up around the world. And so we're constantly training believers to minister to children. Many of them come to us not knowing what to do with kids spiritually. And when they complete their training, they're ready to explain the Bible, to share the gospel, counsel them for the salvation. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful training. So that all is in place. For example, we have a program that we call SPAN, Sponsor and National. Currently, we have 1,378 field workers around the world on span. None of these are in developed nations. The, I'm sorry, none of these are in, yes, in developed nations. They are in nations that are being developed. And so uh, where it's very hard to raise support and they, um, they're they wonderful people, they are trained. And uh, of course we have to raise a lot of money every month to, to provide funds to these uh, workers around the world. And uh, if the Lord provides additional funding, we want to double that number. It's costing us about $270,000 a month to fund those workers. And uh, we have to raise that constantly. But if God doubles that, we'll double the number of workers. Many a times these workers are volunteers and they have their jobs. And if we were able to hire sometimes $250, $300, $400 a month, hire as a worker full-time, and then they go out and literally reach thousands of children every year. So all the pieces are in place, the strategy, the programs. We just need to hit certain accelerators to grow this exponentially. And where do you find these teachers from if they have, they have, um, they have regular daytime jobs? Uh, who are they and where do you recruit them from? So all over the world, also in Canada and USA, uh, for every CEF staff member, there's typically hundreds of teachers and volunteers involved in different capacities. So C CEF is a very heavy volunteer base organization. And, and those individuals, those volunteers are constantly receiving training uh, that we provide, all kinds of levels of training. And so when there are funding available to turn around and hire additional staff, it's very easy to go to our pool of volunteers and uh, challenge them to pray and consider serving the Lord full time. So we don't lack the people. We lack the finances a lot of times. Uh, but God has given us a, a, a very large crowd of of gifted volunteers that are passionate about children that are willing to step into full time ministry. Now, you mentioned uh, several countries that you're working in. Is CEF working in countries impacted by war, such as Ukraine? Yes, we are. We actually are two largest ministries in Europe. We have about 601 staff in uh, in Europe, and we have the region divided in with 48 countries. And, um, and so we have uh, about, I would say, the largest 
two ministries in Europe are Russia and Ukraine, where we have the largest number of staff and where the largest number of children are reached. So we have about 69, 70 full-time staff in Ukraine. About six of them are outside of Ukraine. They had to leave because of the war. And so they're ministering to the multitudes of refugees from Ukraine. Uh, the rest, the majority of them are all in Ukraine ministering. We constantly make trips in there from CEF of Poland, from CEF of Romania, to bring supplies, to bring gospel literature, to bring uh, everything you could think it, they need, including generators and so on, so they can minister, so they can serve. And the ministry they're doing is unbelievable. We get stories all the time of some, some of them we heard recently, they're near the front where the war is. And so these two teachers, when they, or these two staff, when they go out to teach clubs with the children, they, uh, as, with all the, the resources they need to pack for the club, they also bring bullet vests, bulletproof vests, because they're near the front. And so many times, uh, when those missiles come, the fire alarm, the, the alarms in the cities go off. By law, they have to stop what they're doing and run to the basements, to the bomb shelters. And, and as soon as they get back into the basement, they continue the Bible lesson or continue the club hour. And the kids are eager to continue learning about God. So God is doing a great ministry, he actually in both countries, even though this is such a uh, a nasty, such an evil situation, this war. That's just amazing to hear. And it's just such a different world out there, like learning the gospel when there's missiles falling all around you. But now tell us about these, the Good News Clubs, which are part of your American efforts, because I also understand that you now also have these Good News Clubs in Canadian schools as well. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the Good News Club is the, is the ministry, it's sort of the flagship ministry of CEF. There are weekly Bible clubs that happen through the school year. We do them around the world. I think we have about 79,000 around the world in a, in a given year, and it's growing all the time. Uh, in uh, 2001, June 2001, the United States Supreme Court had made a decision uh, on a vote six to three that it was constitutional for CEF to have good news clubs in public schools. So uh, we have had thousands and thousands of schools with clubs and we continue to grow that ministry. Uh, and I believe that also in Canada, there are opportunities, especially in Manitoba, uh, uh, for schools to open up for Bible clubs on, on a weekly basis. Now, you mentioned the Supreme Court. Obviously, like things uh, can kind of escalate with challenges because our society is becoming increasingly se secular. So tell us about some of the challenges you do come across. Um, some of the challenges with those school clubs is sometimes the principal or the superintendent don't want the club in there. And so uh, so they give us the runaround and uh, we're very gracious and patient with them and say, hey, look at the decision of the Supreme Court. If you open the school for these other groups, then you cannot exclude CEF just because we teach the Bible. Uh, most of the time they open the door. Every so often it requires Liberty Council, a group of, of Christian attorneys that we work with to write a letter, attorney to attorney letter. Most of the time that letter unlocks that resistance. But every so often there's, uh, you know, principals or superintendents that dig their heels and say, no, you won't come. And in those situations, we'll follow, file a lawsuit. We have one right now in a school district in Rhode Island. After two years of waiting and and asking for them to open the facility and them saying no to us and allowing other groups to open. So that lawsuit is going on right now. Again, we're not filing a lawsuit for money. We just need we just want the right to be treated like other groups. Another uh, other attacks that we've received that have come over the recent years, I would say the last uh, eight, nine years, seven, eight, nine years from uh, atheist groups. Uh, they attack us in a variety of ways. More recently, the Satan Clubs, which are basically atheists trying to uh, create a big splash in the community with their, you know, scary Satan Clubs to force the, the school leadership and the community to push them out. And in order to push them out legally, they have to push out our club. That's their strategy. Oh. Is nothing but is nothing but atten uh, an, a, another attempt because they've been at this for a number of years now. It's an, another attempt 
at pushing Bible clubs out like the Good News Club. And that's basically what's happening. But in all these cases, uh, our Good News Clubs just keep growing. I mean, God has kept the doors open and people that learn about the opportunity to teach the Bible in public schools, they get fired up and uh, and they get behind us and support us. And it's a wonderful thing to see what God is doing. I had no idea that was part of a strategy to uh, to get Christian groups out. Uh, that That's really interesting that you mentioned that. I'd never thought of it that way. Uh, Moses, so we're out of time, but thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your interest. I invite the, the viewers to go to cfonline.com and check out where the closest CF office is to where they live and get involved. Moses Estevez is the Executive Vice President of Child Evangelism Fellowship.